Welcome back to the Why Mayo podcast. This is Janine Steen, your host, hoping to answer your who, what, when, where, how, and why questions when it comes to myofunctional therapy. So we are back. Um, today, I want to review um, some other identifying criteria or other ways um, that may suggest or may help you identify a tongue thrust or um, some things that you may see that could be the cause or um, perpetuating or exacerbating that tongue thrust. So today specifically, I'm going to speak of um, a patient's medical history, especially when it has to do with their airway. So um, the most impo- one of the most important things that are necessary um, in order to do or conduct or to be successful at um, myofunctional therapy or a myofunctional therapy program is you must have a clear airway. Um, and when I say airway, I mean both, uh, I mean your nasal cavity, your both sides, your both, your nares on both sides, uh, as well as your oral pharyngeal cavity and your oral cavity. So as we are um, thinking of those areas, um, we specifically go through um, and probe a patient's medical history significantly because it can tell us a lot about how um, their tongue thrust maybe be gotten, had gotten worse or why it perpetuated um, beyond that early toddlerhood um, time frame or why it seems to have gotten worse um, or why it seems to have regressed um, if it was in fact how it needed to be or being uh, being done correctly and um, I should say successful at a myofunctional therapy program before. So um, when we are asking about medical history, um, one of the questions we always ask is, does your child have any history of strep throat or tonsillitis, um, allergies, um, and one of those, the most important thing or what we are looking for there is um, based on the number of times this occurs and how frequently um, did they have chronic strep throat, um, did they have chronic allergies, um, it will tell us even if we are not seeing it at, at the time of the eval um, that this patient has had multiple episodes or multiple um, periods of time where her his or her tonsils um, and or adenoids were enlarged um, and Typically, um, when we see that, we often will find that there's some sort of nasal congestion or fluid in the ears. Um, There's a hay fever or um, some other type of allergy. Um, And if the patients, when we look in that oral cavity, if their patient's tonsils um, are enlarged and they have a pretty significant history of throat related infections, um, it's definitely, um, that would definitely be a case for us to refer to an ear, nose and throat specialist um, and to make sure that um, that patient has enough um, space in their airway um, that they're able to um, retract their tongue fully because nothing is interfering with that their ability to do so. Um, and hopefully um, they are not uh, presenting with or um, have a diagnosis of sleep ap- apnea um, as a result of those enlarged tonsils. Um, the other thing um, when we're asking about um, their history and we're talking about whether they have a, a history of ear infections or fluid um, allergies, um, if that's the case, and oftentimes we will look at our patients and see these really dark circles under their eyes. And um, those dark circles are often called allergic shiners, um, but oftentimes um, allergy shiners, but oftentimes too, we see those individuals that have those dark circles, but it also seems just like everything is, there's just overall low tone. It feels, sound, looks almost like the face is fag, um, sagging. Um, the mouth is open, the lips look a little bit um, swollen or maybe retracted the upper lip is retracted 
Um, and that's something um, when we see that type of patient or that type of presentation, um, it's called something called adenoid facies. Um, and that's suggesting to us that even though we can't see the adenoids, it does appear as if they are enlarged. And if your adenoids are enlarged, um, we often find that um, our patients can have a history of sleep apnea. Um, we see that oftentimes with children that have chronic fluid and ear infections. Um, we also see it even with allergies. Um, and we, at that point too, it would be really important for us to, again, make that referral to the ear, nose, and throat specialist, um, but also um, to request that they actually scope the patient. Um, since you cannot see the adenoids without um, a scope within into the nasal cavity, um, we would ultimately like to have that patient scoped so that we can see um, if they have a clear airway, how significantly obstructed their airway may be by their adenoids. Um, is there any sign of a deviated septum or swelling within the nasal cavity or congestion um, that's ultimately limiting our patient from breathing through their nose with their mouth closed? Um, are they uh, do, are they ha are they reliant on nasal breathing versus I mean I'm sorry mouth breathing versus nasal breathing? Um, all of those um, questions are things that pop into our mind um, when we are looking and observing some of these symptoms. Um, many of our patients wind up um, with their tonsils and adenoids removed um, because their t assessment for um, sleep apnea came back as significant. Um, I. I think many parents and many families think um, of sleep apnea as, you know, your dad way back and when, um, and he just snored. He literally chopped wood while he was breathing with his snoring. Um, that's not the same for pediatrics. Um, pediatric sleep apnea can, um, does not just have to be snoring. Actually, some of the symptoms associated with pediatric sleep apnea um, are hyperactivity and lethargic, a misdiagnosis of AD attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, it often is associated with bedwetting in children. Um, it is often associated with restless sleeping. Um, we often, um, there's even been misdiagnoses of learning disabilities um, specifically identified learning disability has more to do with the sleep apnea than um, a learning disability independent of that. Um, so in pediatrics, we definitely look for a wide variety of symptoms. Um, does the child like to nap often? Um, and again, do they have those really dark circles under their eyes? Um, many parents will say, my child sleeps you know, 10 hours a night and that is wonderful. However, if your child is not getting into their REM sleep pattern, then they are not getting a good solid sleep where they are well rested and thus resulting in some, all, or many of these symptoms. Um, and again, they're so varied from, they can be lethargic to hyperactive. It's just specific to that child. Um, I can't tell you how many parents um, come back after uh, their child has their tonsils and or adenoids removed and are shocked by the turnaround um, in their child, not just from an academic standpoint, um, but from an attentional standpoint. Um, it, the child's sleep pattern changes, their whole personality changes. So for today, I am going to leave it there and I will pick up more about what is um, what part of the developmental or medical history um, could potentially perpetuate or exacerbate their tongue thrust or that could be a good indicator that we need to be looking or searching for one.